welcome and welcome back to the Northern Showcase. We hope you've all had a wonderful summer. We have as well. We look forward to spending the next hour with you. And I'm Penny Renshaw, a former stage manager and now a Webflow developer in Trenton, Ontario, and I handle communications for No Code North. I'm Jeremy LaRue, writer, director, turned Webflow, low code developer from Vancouver. On the No Code North team, I'm the resident automations guy and the runner of the streams. Hey, I'm Maggie Monceau. I'm a Webflow developer based in Toronto with a background in film and television. In our No Code North group, I take care of our designs and our gather space. Our mission at No Code North is twofold. First, to build a community of Canadian web flowers and no code enthusiasts. And secondly, to showcase that Canadian talent to the rest of the world. We meet Fridays at noon Eastern in our lodge, our gather space, and once a month, we host the Northern Showcase here on our YouTube channel. So I think people are still coming in. So maybe we'll, oh, here's Skylar. Hey, how's it going? Uh, but we'll let people uh, come in and uh, <laughs> better have a red flannel on. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, but um, it, once more people are in, just so you know, if there's any questions, uh, just throw them in the chat and uh, we'll either get to them through the interview or at the end. Hey, Patrick. Great. All right. It's almost time for Webflow Conf. And if you're going to be in the Toronto area on October 5th, join us for the TO Watch Party. We'll put up a link uh, shortly to uh, have you register and let us know that you're interested. We'll st we're still working on a venue, but we'll let you know as soon as uh, we've got something nailed down. All right. On today's Northern Showcase, we're going to meet Eric Unger, a Canadian Webflow consultant and loco developer. As a Webflow expert, he builds high performance websites for small businesses and startups at his Guelph, Ontario based web studio, North Designs, and provides technical development for various marketing agencies. With over eight years experience, some of his notable clients include Sonic Cloud, First Session, HoneyBook, Live CA, Canada's largest cloud accounting firm. Please help us welcome Eric. Hey, Eric. Hey, everybody. Hey, Eric. Thanks Hello. for having me. Hey, how you doing? Great to welcome. be here. Excellent. Hey, I, just how was your, how was... I was going to say, so a good job on that. That looks great. I don't know if you did like a marketing site for them or what, but um, yeah, it's good to have. Good Thanks. Yeah, definitely a good one to have in the portfolio. Um, what was your summer like? How did you how did you spend it? Did you go anywhere interesting? Oh, it was a good summer. Uh, sometimes it slows down with work, but um, this year I was pretty busy. I took a small trip to Ottawa, uh, a couple mm -hmm. days. Great, great city to explore in the summer. Um, okay. I went to Niagara Falls for a day, but pretty much just local trips. Nothing too crazy this year. It was a good summer, though. Good. Excellent. So we were kind of digging around, of course, as we do, and uh, we found a picture from WebflowConf last year. That's right. Tell us about Tell us about being at WebflowConf last year, since that's coming up soon. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, it was. I was very surprised how many people showed up there. I think they ended up selling like hundreds of more tickets than they originally planned to. Um, of course, in that photo, I met Vlad, the CEO of Webflow. Um, I thought that he recognized me, but then I heard later that he's just looking at people's name tags and saying their names. So <laughs> maybe he didn't actually recognize me, but it was nice to chat with him and uh, congratulate him on you know everything that they launched in the Webflow Conf. So last year was all about uh, superpowers, as they call it. Right. And what's your superpower? <laughs> Good question. Um, my superpower would have to be um, probably anything to do with connecting businesses and web technology. So that's my main focus in business. So. Um, I'm not sure yet if I've found exactly a technical aspect that would be my superpower, but uh, we'll see what comes with Webflow Comp this year, and maybe I'll start to learn some of those new technologies. Excellent. Cool. So um, how did you get into building websites? Mm. Yeah, so building websites, I think my first uh, opportunity to do that was back probably in when I was in high school or even before that, and I was building a, a tech blog 
because I was in, within the community of um, a, a network called Twit. I don't know if you're familiar with it. This Week in Tech. Um, it's uh, one of the old podcast networks. Um, and I've met a lot of sort of my first online friends through that. Um, so around that time is when I started a blog using WordPress. And that was my introduction to really figuring out um, CSS and HTML and WordPress themes. And those are back when you had to do the server side as well. So you're actually mm -hmm. installing WordPress yourself and everything. Right. Um, after that, it progressed into having some freelance opportunities, doing a site for a family member, um, exploring like Dreamweaver and tools that were like a lot more full code. You'd have to learn everything yourself to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I guess Dreamweaver is the original no-code website builder or one of them, um, but it was a real pain to work with. So I don't know if that was a good introduction to the web, but uh, somehow I made it through. I picked WordPress to stick with and uh, mm -hmm. it just went uh, up from there. Cool. All right. So before we go further into the discussion around websites, have you ever considered any other careers? Um, because mm. we saw this post recently. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. I like that post. That's um, actually not a true story, that tweet. Okay. Um, someone else had said something similar for something that was um, a lot different than Webflow, but I thought I would adapt it um, mm -hmm. just to kind of point out the fact that um, maybe web developer is a career that people aren't necessarily sure what it is or how important it is or what value you can bring. Um, mm -hmm. So Certainly, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to be a doctor. That wasn't really my interest. Okay. Um, right. I think to answer your question, if I would have had to pick a different career, I probably would have went into uh, finance, accounting, um, that sort of direction. Mm -hmm. um, or originally, back in the day when you actually had to repair computers and stuff, I may have done like IT stuff. Um, right. I was big into like repairing old Macs and that kind of tech. Right. So, so you, you're still quite young, as I recall, you recently mm -hmm. had a birthday and you're now. Yes. 27th birthday. Excellent. Um, and so you started building websites back in high school. So mm -hmm. you've been at this for quite a while, even though you're still quite young. Uh, yeah, definitely. So I, I probably my first, when I mentioned the Dreamweaver and the WordPress sites, I would guess that was maybe like uh, 2010. So like 13 years ago or something, mm -hmm. um, I had to dig up the date of when I started using Webflow, but the actual WordPress sites go way back. And there was also a period of time where I wasn't doing this professionally or like people weren't paying me to do it, right? It was just something right. I was learning because I was interested in it. And I think that's why I've become successful in this business because it was just this natural interest that I fell into. I didn't mm -hmm. ever go to school and they say, okay, you have to pick what your career is going to be. Um, it was basically, okay, I'm going to work for myself or work for a small company, not go out there and get a regular job because I went to a long university course for it. Right. right. So how did you get started with Webflow and when was that? Yeah, my, my account was created. I had to look up the date. It was March 29th of 2015. Uh, so about eight and a half years ago. Right. At that time, I wasn't really sure what it was, but I must have come across it on YouTube. Um, I think the Flux, uh, the Flux videos, I think is the name of the channel. Um, they had introduced me to that. And then I kept an eye on it while I was still building WordPress sites. And I think it just got to a point where I realized WordPress wasn't efficient enough to turn this into a business. I was spending too long on all my projects. Mm -hmm. And once I realized in Webflow, even starting with a template, how much further you could get than starting with a WordPress theme, it became a natural right. step but it was a big move to start selling it to clients because everybody at that time and even today, they know what WordPress is, they're comfortable with it. So you have to really sell them on the value of Webflow, um, right? So once I, got, once I was comfortable to do that, then Webflow became the default tool and now I've been able to give up my WordPress clients. Right, and so what, what sorts of, or what, how do you, get across those those benefits of working with Webflow? What is it that you sort of focus on most mm. for the people that don't know about Webflow? Yeah, so most of the benefits, um, I like to, when I'm talking to clients specifically, I like to show them the editor, which Webflow is now redesigning to have a different interface. But anyway, the difference between the editor is like a basic version of the Webflow designer. 
-hmm. So when you bring a client into a project that I have built, I can lock down what they're able to edit so they don't have to worry about breaking the site. That was a big mm. concern within, web, within WordPress, even with all the site builders. If you click the wrong button, you might have deleted a whole section and you couldn't really lock down what the client was doing. So that's the, the mm. big benefit I see from a client perspective. For right. myself, it's the time of development and being able to design directly in the development tool. So when I started mm. doing design, I wasn't ever... My process wasn't like to open up Figma or something and do the design and then not have a way to develop it. Right. I pretty much always did my work directly in Webflow. And when you compare that to something like WordPress, it just made a much easier workflow. So I could sell them on the value of not only it being faster, which made the cost less for them, but the flexibility and you're able to iterate on different versions so quickly. Right. And so now you are a Webflow expert. When did that happen? Mm -hmm. When did you become an yeah, expert? Yeah, so I applied, um, I applied once, I think, uh, maybe back in like 2018 or 2019. But I certainly wasn't an expert, and my application wasn't, um, uh, wasn't approved. But I did apply again back in 2021 when I felt like I was actually a Webflow expert, and I had a great portfolio of sites to show them. Um, so they had approved my application. I think it was like April of 2021, so mm -hmm. um, over two years ago. Right. And that was an important moment in my career because I saw that as like the next step in somebody recognizing that I actually have this skill that I've been building since 2015 or whenever I started using Webflow. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to use that as a sales tool, but also just use it to reinforce, reinforce the fact to myself that I am actually an expert in this. And that's what someone is paying me for the value I can bring based on that. Right. Yeah. Sometimes that, that, you know, self-confidence mm -hmm. in exactly. what you're, you know, selling people is the most important part of that, of that conversation that you have with mm -hmm. them. Um, but has becoming a Webflow expert made a difference to the type of clients who are seeking you out or that you're going after? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I thought that it would have a bigger impact in that sense. Um, I think the clients who are finding me through the experts directory, uh, which is Webflow's own database where they have this tool where the client can put in their information and then it tries to match them with a few recommendations. So mm -hmm. if I come up in the recommendations, then a client can reach out to me to get help with that project. So I think it builds that automatic trust because I'm linked to from the Webflow site, they see everything that they love on webflow.com and then it funnels them towards me. So I don't need to, for one, I don't need to sell them on the Webflow and why it's great. They already know that. Mm -hmm. And two, I don't have to sell them on the fact that I'm experienced and that I know what I'm doing. So it's helped in that sense, but it hasn't generated super large projects that have really changed the direction of my career. Mm -hmm. um, it's given me similar to other sales channels that I would get those leads from. Right. Um, so it's definitely been helpful, but I think it's not necessarily as important as people think if you are currently a Webflow developer and you really wanna become one. I don't think at this point in time, it's gonna change your career that much. If you're already really good at Webflow, then you just need to show people, get your portfolio out there and actually um, make yourself visible. Right. So, yes, so I, I'm sorry, I wasn't actually watching the comments, <laughs> even though I had said I'll pop the comments up. Um, but Steve had asked a question around that uh, mm -hmm. Webflow. Now, Webflow Professional Partner, is that the same as a Webflow Expert or is that a different designation? Yeah, so right now they're, um, they're both the same, uh, same program. Basically, you take the certification exams, which are open to anybody. I think when I did it, they only had two. And now I think they have four or five of them. Um, so once you take the certification exams, then you're in line to be an expert or a certified expert. Uh, the partner program is what you apply for, which they then deem you an expert in. So your, your little badge, if you want to put a badge on your website, would be like Webflow Professional Partner or Webflow Enterprise Partner for the larger mm -hmm. companies. Um, and it's basically you're taking or they're giving you an opportunity to get commissions on the hosting and the site plans through Webflow. Um, so it kind of works like an affiliate program on that side. But the other side is that whole database that I mentioned where they're matching you up with clients. Right, right, cool. Okay. 
Oh, and of course, I love the fact that um, Keith noticed that you're wearing plaid. <laughs> of course, I dressed up comment. today. I yes. know, I know. You're such a good Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Canadian mug, too. Um, all right. Oh. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so um, oops, oops, I just lost my questions. There we are. Uh, so how are you finding new clients then? Um, if you're not, if they're not sort of coming to you necessarily through the Webflow Experts program, how are you finding them? And are they more local to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have uh, three different ways of finding clients right now. The big one, and this is just natural progression as you get more experience, is referrals from your previous clients. Mm -hmm. So, of course, when you're new to this industry, you can't rely on those. That's just something that, you know, you kind of work towards by networking with people and just doing a really good job for your existing clients. The second is the local marketing. Um, a big one, it, it sounds simple, but it's really just having a listing on Google Maps. So if someone in my mm -hmm. local area searches for web design, and because I have like uh, a dozen or so reviews on there, I'm going to come up first, depending on location. Right. Um, so, you know, sounds kind of obvious, but a lot of businesses don't have that. So um, mm -hmm. that can begin as just a simple phone call or it could be someone coming to my site and then following my work and then months later, they end up reaching out to me. Right. The, the third thing would be the, um, actually I'll, I'll step backwards one and say that some of my earlier clients were coming from Upwork, which is a freelancer platform where it oh, connects yeah. clients and freelancers. Mm -hmm. um, of course, those have to stay on the Upwork platform. So those are kind of in a box by themselves. Um, right. And I'm, I'm moving out of that just because of the referrals and the other clients I'm getting. Um, and then we can also go into the third aspect, which is the agencies and the other marketing studios that I do work for. Right. So are those local agencies or elsewhere? Um, they're all, uh, most of them are across Canada. There's two or three that I work with in the local area um, mm -hmm. who I've just met through my network or we've just found each other naturally on the internet. Um, so Usually those are still done virtually. So it really doesn't matter that they're close <laughs> by, but it gives that mm -hmm. trust. And it's like, I want to support people and companies in my city and make this into like a collaborative effort. Right, right. And you're actually in an area that is quite a, a tech hub. Um, mm -hmm. Are you working with local startups? Is that a lot of who your clients are? Um, occasionally, yeah. A lot of the local clients end up being like, companies that aren't necessarily internet based. So it's just like a secondary marketing channel for them. Um, mm -hmm. So often you're doing like micro sites or what they call brochure sites, which are just very basic to have information. So for example, mm -hmm. like a cafe or a law firm or something that just needs somewhere to point people to and there's our information, there's our menu, not necessarily using it as a marketing tool. Okay. Um, but when it, for the agencies, um, the, they basically bring clients from all across Canada. So it's not necessarily local clients through them, but the agency themselves mm -hmm. might be local. Right, right. And and often a, a, a company might go to an agency first, not directly to a web developer because exactly. yeah. they need a, a, the whole package. A lot of times they want to get quotes from both. And they, of course, see mm -hmm. because a single person, even even as my small studio, which is basically just myself and, and contractors, the overhead is so much lower and I'm not outsourcing the work to another studio that mm -hmm. they can really see the difference plus the personal connection that an individual would bring them over a studio. Right, so um, are you not working with other developers or do you bring people in to work on projects or do you do everything yourself in-house? Yeah, at the moment, it's a, it's a big mix. I'm kind of in that in-between point where I was solo for a long time. Like I said, I was on Upwork as a freelancer. Um, I really marketed myself as just my own name. And then I started using North Designs uh, when I realized I kind of like this web design thing and I can maybe turn it into a real business. Um, so it's become a combination of outsourcing certain work to other freelancers and contractors, either who I've just met naturally um, through the Webflow communities or found on a freelancer site. So sometimes I like to bring them in on projects. Either they're doing something like white label, meaning the client doesn't necessarily know that they're doing it. Not that I'm hiding it from them, but they're, I'm fulfilling the work um, and passing right. it off to them, right? Handling mm -hmm. the project management, the communication and all that. Um, so there's those ones. 
but there's not like one specific person who I would say, okay, this is my guy that does this task. Um, it can be a range of people depending on their skills. So if a startup comes to me and they have um, a SaaS product, there might be one designer who I want to work with who has experience with that versus mm -hmm. another who just does really awesome restaurant websites. So you can bring in people in like three different categories. I would look at it as project management, uh, design, and then development. And development being the actual uh, creation of a website and turning it into something that can actually be used. Right. Okay. And we have another question that's come in, which kind of goes back mm. to what you were saying earlier. Do you know what proportion of leads are coming from Google Maps or from mm. that Google listing? That's a great question. Yeah, I wish that I had a better answer for Steve, but um, at the moment, I'm not correctly tracking the lead sources in that sense. Um, also combining that with the fact that sometimes it's really difficult to know where the lead came from. Mm. Um, your last resort is basically asking the person, where did you find me? Mm -hmm. But oftentimes they don't know where they found me or they saw me three months ago and then they wrote down my website and then they sent it to their friend and then they contacted me. Right. So it's like <laughs> it's, it's hard to track that down, uh, yeah. especially when it's referrals or it's just, oh, I heard of this guy or I know some guy, you know, across the city that does this work. So um, mm -hmm. the only reason I know it comes from Google Maps um, is if they hit the website and then I get the referral from, from mm -hmm. Google Maps and the URL right. or if they yeah. tell me that they'll say, oh, I just Googled web designer. And then obviously that means they came from, because Google will show the math at the top of the results and mm -hmm. then they'll show the natural organic results. So I don't, right. need, North Designs doesn't even come up on the first page, but I'm first in the Google Maps widget, which is what you see when you first Google. Right, as long as it's a local client. Exactly, yeah, within right. a certain radius. If there's more um, competitors, I guess I could call them, um, mm -hmm. in a wider range, if they have like more positive reviews than me, then, then I, that will bump me down. Right. Um, but to answer Steve's question, I would, if I had to guess, in terms of local clients, it's probably like 70% of them, 80% of them come to me that way. But in mm -hmm. the big picture across the whole business, maybe that's 10% or 15% of my clients. Right, right. Okay, so let's talk about your process of working with a client. How, from the mm. point when, uh, I guess even pre-quoting, right? Or from yeah. that point when they first contact you, how does it go on from there? Yeah, so this is a process that I feel like you're, I'm always trying to improve. Some people have these automated flows where it's like you fill out the form and then it gets added to Airtable and then it emails the team and all that, right? I'm still pretty traditional in that sense. I do have a, um, a CRM that I'm using to track if I need to follow up with someone. It's basically just like um, the Kanban board layout, um, mm -hmm. which I think some of you might be familiar with. It's basically just a way to sort different items. So I'll have like mm -hmm. incoming leads, the ones who I'm working on a proposal with, the ones I need to still schedule a call with, just to remember to follow up with them. So right. when they come in, I put them in that system. Usually it's through like, I'll get an email from Webflow. If it goes through a Webflow form, I might get a message on one of my social media accounts or just someone emails or calls in directly. So I'll mm -hmm. add them in there. And then once they're in that funnel, eventually we'll get to a point of sending them a proposal. And that's maybe 50% um, of the people who reach out to me, right? So they're either not a good fit, they don't align with my values and my communication style, or they simply don't have the budget or the resources to work mm -hmm. with me. So once you kind of filter them out, you don't wanna waste time building a custom proposal for those people. So once you have it down to the ones who are actually a good fit for you, um, because you wanna make sure you're able to actually help them and solve their problem, not just um, mm -hmm. build them a website. So once we get to that point, um, executing the project, I've, I've kind of made that into a more standard process. So the design, a decision is made whether I'm doing the design and whether I'm gonna do it directly with the client working in Webflow or a Webflow template or if I need to bring someone in to help us on that. Or sometimes the client will bring their own design if they have an internal marketing team or someone who mocked up a design for them. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a flow for development, um, which is pretty standard. You get feedback from the client. Um, I use a tool called Pastel, which allows the client to comment directly on the project. And I know Webflow mm -hmm. just introduced a commenting feature as well. So it's very okay. similar where they can visually click 
leave their feedback, and then I can address that feedback, make the necessary changes. Right. Um, throughout development, there has to be a, a testing and like a soft launch or a beta launch phase at the end. Mm -hmm. And that would be launching maybe on their main domain, maybe on the Webflow internal domain, and just testing everything, making sure it actually performs, connecting all the contact forms, that kind of stuff. And then after the website is built, I like to switch to, or at least offer to the clients, a type of maintenance package um, where I can either cover the hosting costs plus maybe an, an hour of my time every month. I don't want to just hand over a site and then leave them on their own. I want to make mm -hmm. sure it's this relationship because I've done so much work to make sure that this client is a good fit for me. I want to make sure we can keep up that relationship. And it's kind of scary as a business owner, if you just receive the website and that's it, it's just, you know, you don't know what to do with it. And a yeah. website's this, this living thing that needs to be updated, needs to be maintained. Um, and often for clients, the, the best thing they like about this is that they can just email me and say, hey, we need to change our email address on the site or something. So it's worth mm -hmm. that couple hundred dollars a month to have someone who they can reach out to, uh, especially for the local clients. This is a big, important step for local clients um, mm -hmm. to have someone right there with them. And I kind of act as their main contact point for the website. Right, right. It takes away some of that pressure of, oh, I have to try to remember how to do that thing. Exactly. Right? Te that, teaching that, them on the editor or or, te yeah. or even for them to remember their password to log in. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I certainly find that that, you know, clients, most clients don't use their website on a regular basis. They're not updating the content on it. If they don't have a blog or some reason to be regularly adding things, they, mm -hmm. it's so easy to forget you know, how to do something when you only do it once or twice a year, perhaps. Right? Exactly. So, and that's not their specialty. Yeah. That's why they hired yeah. me. So yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, so so you don't have any meetings with them sort of once you're actually underway? You don't do like a regular check in meeting? Um, or do you? I don't plan or rather I don't schedule check ins. Mm -hmm. I have the the call basically after they sign the proposal and pay the deposit and kind of the kickoff call. That's where I really yeah. dig deeper into the business because I don't want to spend like, you know, two hours learning about the internals of your business if we're not going to end up working together. Right. So we have that. And sometimes it's necessary to build a site map or a mock-up or a wireframe, which is just a very mm -hmm. basic version that lays out the structure of the site. Right. Sometimes that's necessary, but normally once we get to that point and the client trust that I know what I'm doing and they're happy with that it includes all the information they want on the site. Mm -hmm. We can do like one design, either a homepage or maybe build something directly in Webflow and get their feedback using Pastel just on that one page. Right. Building out the internal pages is usually not as important because the homepage sets the standard for the rest of the site. So you're not going to have or you shouldn't have a client coming to you saying, hey, that internal page, that about page, you know, I need it totally redone with a whole new design because it's gonna generally match the homepage style, right? Mm -hmm. And you wanna make that clear yeah. when you're doing the sitemap with them. So there is a check-in in that sense, but I like to do a lot of it asynchronously. So they can go right. into Pastel, they can add comments whenever they want. Um, right. It's not gonna be a set meeting that takes up time on our calendars, especially for a local client. Imagine you're running a restaurant or a cafe and I wanna have a meeting with you at 9 a.m., right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make sense. So right. if async is possible, meaning that we don't have to both be online at the same time, then that's what I'll default to. But there's right. clients where I'm in Slack with them and they're sending me a message every week on Slack. And then I'm, I'm getting back to them with an estimate of when that'll be done. Right, right. So um, uh, clients are, are comfortable with that process that it, it's, they're not having to regularly feed you, you know, additional Yeah, information. Yeah, I would say they are. There's definitely those few clients who, um, potentially feel like then they're missing out on the opportunity to um, suggest changes to me. But I think when it comes down to actually going through the process, they're happy that it wasn't like, okay, we have to be on a call once mm -hmm. a week. Um, and most of those calls would end up kind of being pointless to them anyway, because they don't care about the technical details or the small mm -hmm. things. They just want the end right. result. Right. 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 Um, now, Michael Collins has a question. Uh, does Eric have a CRM or help ticket app that you're mm -hmm. using? So, yeah. So we there... mentioned we mm -hmm. mentioned CRM. I'm using Capsule, um, Capsule CRM right now. Mm -hmm. um, as for the ticket app, I did try that. And when when he says help ticket, I assume he means like the traditional help desk, kind of like an IT help desk, where you'll the client will send in a request. Um, I was using Help Scout for a while, and that was at a time when I had a lot of of agency clients with a lot of ongoing projects, and there was just 
so many random small change requests coming in that I couldn't keep track of them all in Slack or email. So I said, here's a, here's a form. If you fill out the form or if you email this specific email address, it will go into my system as a ticket. I can prioritize them and make sure I do them in the order they were received. So it kind of works as like a task management or project management app. Um, right. I ended up discontinuing that because I'm, I don't want to have the majority of my day taken up by these little tiny tasks. Mm -hmm. So I try to encourage clients, if we're not on a maintenance plan, especially if I'm going to build them by the hour for small changes, to bundle right. those together, um, especially mm -hmm. so that they're not paying me for an entire hour just so I can change one word on the site. So if right. they can bundle those together and make sure the changes that they're asking for are actually strategic and actually make mm -hmm. an impact on the website, not just changing the shape of a photo or something. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, and we've, yes, talked about maintenance plans. So you moved into a co-working space a few months ago. I'm assuming before that you were working from home? Yeah, that's right. So I was working from home basically... Um, pretty much my whole time working as a web designer. I have worked for other companies occasionally, but um, those have been remote. So I've been working from home and during COVID in 2021, I realized that that maybe isn't the best solution, especially if there's nothing encouraging me to go out. If I'm home all the time, I can just work all the time, right? So there was no physical yeah. separation between those. So I looked into a few mm -hmm. co-working spaces. Of course, people are familiar with WeWork and the big ones, the big names. Those aren't quite as common here in Ontario, so there wasn't any of those near me. But I did find a local building that had a small co-working space that they recently opened, um, which mm -hmm. is uh, where I am right now. So it's uh, each has their own private office. Um, I'll actually be moving down the street to a new one that's being built, but right. um, it's the same concept. So basically, right. it, it gives me somewhere to go. I can walk here. Um, and just get out of the house and that separation to say, okay, now I'm working, I'm going to be productive while I'm here. And then I'm going to go home and I'll leave my work at work. Right. right. So do you ever meet with clients there or does, does being in a co-working space like that give you an opportunity to uh, meet other businesses and collaborate at all? Yeah, very good question. So when it comes to meeting clients, Usually that's not necessary. There have been times where I will go out to a client or, or meet a client here, but it's pretty rare, especially nowadays with the technology we have to work asynchronously, as I mentioned. In-person meetings are not really that helpful. Um, also, there's times where if I have an in-person meeting with a client at the beginning of the project, that might set an expectation that I'm available all the time. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a fine line to go between you know, let's do a Zoom video call or let's meet in person or let's just do something asynchronously over Slack or Pastel. Um, right. As for the actual networking opportunities here, that's something that um, is going to be a bit more apparent at the new space. Um, so it's more of a collaborative network. And that's what I'm trying to build as I scale North Designs to be more collaborative, not only with the local talent, but people ac across North America too. So I want to take that opportunity instead of just being in my own little space. So I'm alone again, I'm just not alone at home. Um, I want to mm -hmm. be part of the community and potentially there's some opportunities to work together with companies that provide similar services to me or complementary services, or like I mentioned, those uh, marketing and branding studios. Right. Right. So I'm not certain if we touched on quite this, but you've been working with Webflow for, as we said, over eight years. So what is it about working in Webflow that you most specifically like when, I, when you're building client sites? What's, what's the main reason that you keep on using it? Yeah, I think, I know there's a lot of what you might call competitors to Webflow or alternative solutions that are no code site builders. Um, mm -hmm. Webflow is, to me, is really the one that has made the biggest impact so far. Um, but the reason that I'm not out there looking for a different solution, I'm not that same feeling that I had with WordPress thinking, okay, Webflow is going to replace this. I don't have that feeling with Webflow yet. Like we need something better. So the main thing is just my experience in it. Obviously it makes it convenient and easy to use because I'm already used to it. And I already know all the small details, but the other part is especially right now with Webflow's recent announcement on Webflow apps, being able to integrate with other services. So Webflow has become this central point 
which that can be, say, your main marketing site for a business. And then you can have all these different products connecting into it, like your CRM, your um, potentially a web application or a directory or a database. And Webflow is that central point for it. And then we can build and scale off of it. So I like to look at it as having a very stable base for your online marketing. And everything then points back to the website. So Webflow just makes that so much easier from, like we mentioned, the editor, which is the way for the client to go in and edit stuff. Or from the designer, how quickly I can mock up a page or borrow existing sections and existing elements and put together a new page for a marketing site. Um, The workflow is just so easy, especially with Reloom and those other tools. Right. I was actually just going to ask, are you using tools like Reloom for Mm -hmm. um, building sites more quickly? Yeah. So anybody who knows Webflow likes to ask what your process is when you're actually deep inside the designer. So Mm -hmm. for me, um, many people are using frameworks like Client First and Mast and those sort of systems. I've developed my own style guide that uses some of those techniques um, and allows me to use the Reloom library, which is a um, marketplace or rather a database of pre-made sections for Webflow. So I can drag those into my own style guide take out the parts that aren't relevant or that I don't need, and then make it fit in and blend in with the styles I've already set on the site. So if I'm working on a design or if I'm working off of no design, I'm just building a site directly in Webflow, I can take those in as a starting point and mm-hmm. then show the client, here's a potential layout for solving this problem. If you know the problem could be we need to show the social proof on the site, like testimonials, or we need to have a contact form. Well, here's all these options in Reloom that are already built. We can drop it into the site that I'm building in Webflow and have this functionality and the layout already finished. So I'd say those kind of tools, and there's a lot of them out there. I'm just using Reloom library as an example because that's the one I use. Mm -hmm. Um, It could save you maybe 30 to 50% on the development time. Right, and have you looked at their AI site builder system yet? I've taken a look at it. Yeah, I might be using it for an upcoming project. Um, I think a lot of the parts for certain projects, it's not necessary to have that much detail Mm -hmm. when you're first starting it. You know, maybe it makes more sense to do my traditional process of building the homepage and then building the internal pages. But the great thing I like about it is the best part is with the filler text. So the placeholder, like the lorem ipsum text. Mm. So one of the big things I notice when I'm building with those tools, the client doesn't get an idea of what content you're actually designing around. So it's great that they have a way to potentially generate some content, whether you're using Reloom tools or some other tool to generate the content and dropping Mm -hmm. it in uh, in directly into the sitemap. And then you're going to be able to show the client, here's the actual functionality of this. It's not just something pretty. Right. And it perhaps gets them thinking a little bit more about their content as opposed Mm -hmm. to squinting their eyes going, I can't read that. What does it say? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And and content's probably an important step that we sort of skipped over, which is basically making sure that the client can actually work with you and has the information about their business that they Mm -hmm. want on the site, right? The worst thing is when you have to design with no content. So you're putting the placeholder text, even if it's AI generated, maybe it doesn't make sense to have that much on the page, or maybe the client only has certain services with certain descriptions. So you want to either have, and I think that falls into that um, time at the beginning of the project when I said we create a sitemap. That's Mm -hmm. also not just the visual aspect, but it's the content and the actual performance of the site too. Right. And so most of the time, are, are clients providing you with content or are they working with content writers? Do you ever bring writers in? Yeah, there is a content writer um, in Canada that I work with, but it's pretty rare nowadays that we need that. A lot of times I can set out a outline and the client can kind of fill it in, even if they're filling it in with bullet points. And then I can turn it into real text that actually makes sense on the site. Um, A typical thing that I notice that business owners might not realize they're doing is that they want to write a lot of information about themselves in these big paragraphs. And -hmm. that just doesn't work. on on a marketing website, right? So I can take that, they can either, um, they can write an entire novel if they wanted, and I'll just take out little bits and pieces of it, basically bullet points, use those as headings on the site. I'll write up a little short form description. And if they think I missed something critical, we can go back and rewrite that, or we can use AI tools to improve it. So 
it's basically narrowing down what they provide to me. Usually they have like an old website or they hand me a brochure that they have or some sort of asset. Um, if they're mm -hmm. starting with absolutely nothing, then we need to go a little bit more detailed in that uh, project outline and the sitemap. Right. And I think that's right. where AI can, can be really useful. Right. And Grace has said she's uh, she's been loving the AI site builder, site mm -hmm. map builder. I think a lot of us are, are pretty amazed at what it can do and how it can, you know, speed up some of that early process. Right. It's just yeah. just to have because I just think to give you I a find, starting point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think sometimes clients just they don't necessarily they don't they don't have a picture in their mind of what you know, all the bits and pieces are that they might mm -hmm. need, but, but the site builder, site map builder can basically kind of, you know, give them a, a good basic starting point and then they can take it from there too. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Eric, uh, Patrick has a question as well. Um, do you have any opinions on anything that Webflow still has to improve on or is missing? And that just leads mm. into my next question. So, yeah, this is a good, uh, topic, especially when it comes to Webflow Conference coming up next mm -hmm. month. Yep. Um, so the default thing I always think about, and this is because I was so excited about these features, is when Webflow came out with the e-commerce and the memberships option. It mm -hmm. sounds to me like they've paused development on those features at the moment. Um, fortunately, there is some third-party apps, and Webflow is going very deep into the third-party app marketplace, mm -hmm. which is cool. Mm -hmm. um, there's some third-party apps that integrate directly that can reproduce those features or recreate them in a very similar or even better way than Webflow was able to do. So opinions on what they have to improve. I'm, I think we're either looking in the direction of like making it the front end for every low code tool where everything integrates in and you don't have to go outside of Webflow to get to mm -hmm. those. And I think they're already kind of doing that with the built-in apps that they announced a few weeks ago. And knowing that they made that change just a couple of weeks before, before Webflow conference makes me think that there's something big coming and it's going to be related to those external third-party apps. So I can't pinpoint one specific thing they have to improve. Like, of course, there's all these little things that you, that you come to be familiar with while you're designing in Webflow. Um, and they're pretty good about taking feedback on Twitter or social media or from the forums and actually making those changes directly in the designer. So that's always been mm -hmm. nice. But the, the big part is definitely making it um, either going as far as turning it into a web app, which some of those third-party tools are doing, or just mm -hmm. making it that you're potentially able to edit code directly in Webflow with it being a no-code tool, but still relying on JavaScript and other web snippets. Even back in the early days of Webflow, or it was especially more important back then, you had to write your own mm -hmm. JavaScript to do certain features. Uh, okay. So right. I'd like to and see now, potentially some improvement there. Right. And and now, I mean, so many people want to be able to, you know, they've, they've discovered this tool and they want to be able to do so much more. And mm -hmm. so people are really going into the JavaScript area. Yeah. Have you exactly. checked Especially out? with AI. Yeah. Yeah, have you checked out the Slater app yet? It seems to be the thing everybody is talking about these days. Yeah, I've taken a look at it. I do have an account. Um, mm -hmm. I've watched some of the videos and it's super powerful. I love how you're able to go from a more traditional setup of having a code editor open, then having to paste mm -hmm. the code into Webflow and then publish the site and then test it in a browser. Yeah. And this could have been super helpful. So next time I have to add JavaScript, I will do it through Slater. And then it's cool right. because you can save, I believe you can save it into like a library. You can use that across other sites. So instead of having to dig up one of my old projects and say, okay, how did I do this interaction? Mm. I know I can't do the interaction with Webflow, but I did it with JavaScript. Now I need to dig up my old site and paste in the code and modify it. So I think that's going to be a huge opportunity, but it's, it's also getting to that edge of, should I learn JavaScript? Should I be better at JavaScript mm. to make full use of that? Right. Right. I, I think the thing I worry about, and and it's nothing to do with Slater particularly, is just, you know, it's so easy to go and ask chat GPT or some, you know, someplace or even just go to Stack Overflow and find, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a JavaScript solution to something, but you don't know whether it's a good solution or not. Exactly. And the yeah. compatibility with, with cross browsers. Yes. And, That's and why it's other... great to rely on the community 
potentially mm -hmm. for sharing those. And I think Slater's working on a much better way for other Webflow experts to share their code. Right. Or I should say right. other JavaScript experts. Yeah, I think it was really smart of them to sort of go that route mm -hmm. of you know, making that the thing that they were going to focus on. And, uh, yeah, and I wonder if Webflow is looking at that. Um, and potentially when I said having improvement on editing the actual code in Webflow, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's some sort of similar or complementary feature that might be coming right. out. Right. Would you ever want to be able to edit the actual CSS code? I know I've seen people sort of mm -hmm. ask about that the odd time. Yeah, I think I think my answer would be no. And if you understand Webflow enough, your mm -hmm. answer will always be no. Because CSS is, is basically the whole point of the Webflow designer, right? That's where you're right. visually getting. Maybe if you're already so comfortable typing out your own CSS, maybe that is faster than doing it in the Webflow designer. But mm -hmm. especially with the you know last decade of people starting their career or starting their web experience with these low code or no code tools, there's not going to be as many people who just want the raw CSS. And if you do want that, you can export it from Webflow. You can't host it right. with Webflow, but you do have access and you can still mm -hmm. inspect it and make sure that it's still you know in a format in the way that you would want it. But right now you can add custom CSS within your page or within your project if you really need to, to overwrite certain things. There's certain elements in Webflow that you don't have the CSS control over, but Webflow is also adding more and more features to, to fix that. Right, right. So um, are you attending WebflowConf? Since we were sort of yes, I am. So WebflowConf <laughs> is across uh, four cities um, this year. So I'll be going to the New York City event. Um, right. Unfortunately, we could only pick one. So I know many of you are going to be in the Chicago location, but um, hopefully I will... Uh, find some of you in the New York City. I think I've been here. I, I could be mistaken, but I think I'm getting a sense that there may be a few, there may be the possibility of attending another one. If there was, mm. is there one that you would choose to go to? Yeah, as my second option, I chose San Francisco. It was going to be my first option, but I realized that's just such a long trip and it's only a one day event, whereas the mm. other locations are effectively a two day event with the workshops. Right. So. Right. I'm looking forward to attending the watch party in Toronto. And I think we can all celebrate what Willowflow has announced there together. Mm -hmm. Then I'll fly down to New York. Potentially, it would be great to um, visit Chicago too. I know a lot of Canadians mm -hmm. from the West Coast who can't make it to the San Francisco location will be down there. Right, yes. And for those of you who don't know, who haven't heard yet, the No Code North crew is going to be having our very first, all three of us together meet it in, uh, in Chicago. Finally. So we're all gonna be there. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um, so do you see your business evolving over the next few years? And if, if so, what direction? Or are you happy sort of mm -hmm. going with where you are now and just continuing on? Yeah, so I think the business is always evolving. It's whether I want to take that next step into expanding my team. Like I mentioned that I work with other contractors and freelancers. It's a matter of potentially having someone who's more permanent or someone who I use all the time and always have ongoing projects with. It's also hard to find those people because someone who's an expert in Webflow can potentially do things directly with clients or can work for a company's marketing team. And it's really right. hard to find great Webflow freelancers that are available when you need them. There's a huge network and I know dozens of amazing Webflow developers, but they need to be available and they need to be able to do the work that the client wants at the time that they want it. So right. the evolution of a business naturally in my position is to either partner up with one other studio and, and form something larger or bring in people full-time or part-time to turn a small studio into more of an agency. So it's a kind of a scary step. And I'm hoping this move to my next co-working space, um, having such good networking opportunities there that it'll kind of help me make that decision. Mm -hmm. Whether I wanna just find someone to join me but then at the same time, you lose the benefit of working for yourself and being mm -hmm. able to make all the decisions. So it's yep. this huge step. It's kind of like, I want to test that out for a while and then mm -hmm. maybe I'll decide. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so I think we'll sort of, we're done with business. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other things that you like to spend your time doing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed as I was digging around in, in your uh, 
various social platforms. You're quite interested in flying, is that? Mm -hmm. And and you've actually mentioned an interest in aviation. Are you? That's right. Taking flying lessons. Um, I have I have been interested in it for quite a while. I ended up taking my first lesson um, before COVID. Um, and it was pretty cool. It was it was in a little Cessna 172 plane. Um, it's it's something that I'd like to do outside of web development. It's like my mm -hmm. whole life revolves around web technologies, and right as most of us were so deep into this, it's like oh, that's also my hobby is learning webflow and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to get into aviation a bit more. Right now, I'm just going to certain air shows. Um, there's a local airport that has meetups sometimes. So I like to be involved in that community a little bit. And maybe there's an opportunity there to kind of mix my business and aviation, but haven't quite figured that out yet. Maybe right. I'll take another lesson. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I would pass the um, medical exam in order to be a pilot, but oh. I can still do pretty much like almost half of the lessons you can do because there's another pilot, right? So mm. And in order to keep your license anyway, you would need to have a certain number of hours. And I don't think right now I could commit that anyway. So right. at the moment, it's just a hobby, something that, you know, is kind of fun to, to look at on the side, but um, right. probably not right. like a career direction, which I think is good. I, it's good to have something that is not career based. So. Yeah, exactly. It can just be something that you do to get away from. Exactly. Work. Yes. Yeah. Good distraction. So, and you also talk often about real estate. You were, especially during the pandemic, you were posting quite often. I don't know if that was because mm. the, the crazy house prices were just on everybody's mind, or is that something that you're actually interested in pursuing more? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. Um, I think during the pandemic, it was just such an interesting time. And back at the beginning when we were talking, I mentioned my other career direction may have been like finance and accounting and, and mm -hmm. real estate, I think is like a natural uh, progression of that. Um, so when I was younger, I was like a few years ago, not, you know, not much younger, I was able to get a rental property and rent it out to tenants in the city. So that was my first experience um, beyond helping my parents with what they're doing in real estate, being able mm -hmm. to actually maybe make money on that, but maybe also see if there's opportunity for growth there. Um, so I ended up selling that condo unit during or a little bit after the peak of the 2021 crazy market. And if there's anybody from outside Canada watching, um, in fact, I think most countries are having this problem right now, but real estate has been, you know, super high. And I thought mm -hmm. I would take those funds, potentially invest it in my business or invest it elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. and just, you know, contribute that unit back to the open market. So um, it's right. still, a, you know, kind of a cool investment opportunity, not something that I want to contribute my whole, you know, all the profit from the studio it doesn't go into real estate or anything. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just something that I've kind of keeping an eye on. And potentially on Twitter, I follow a few people who are experts in the industry. So it's just cool to keep up with all the stats right. and just the craziness going on. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, you're interested in economics. Um, I I don't think I've seen any other web flowers post the you know the head of the central bank on their Twitter feeds. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, it's, my yeah. Twitter's kind of a random mix of all my interests. So you'll see some airplane photos sometimes too. Right. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. So, uh, Eric, how can people find you online? What's the best way that they can connect with you? Yeah, I think right now um, LinkedIn. You can find mm -hmm. me and uh, on more of a professional side. And then for Twitter, you have it on the screen there. Uh, the mm -hmm. ONCA being Ontario, Canada. Some people don't realize that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's my Twitter handle there. Um, the same for Instagram. I don't post a lot on there. Um, but you can also go to northdesigns.ca and there's a contact form right in the center of that page. In fact, it's one of the only things that are on that site. And you can reach out to me that way. All right. Perfect. Excellent. I'd be ha Please happy to connect. Right. And anybody who's going to be in New York, make sure you connect with Eric. Mm -hmm. um, and, yep. uh, send, and send me a your... message on, on Twitter or something if you're going to be there and we'll uh, make sure we find each other. Great. OK, so that brings us to the end of our 10th Northern Showcase. We would like to thank you all for joining us and remind you to like this video, subscribe to our channel and join us if you're in the Toronto area at our watch party coming up on October 5th. And take it away, folks. <laughs> or actually, 
excuse me, I'm silly. I'm silly. <laughs> I'm supposed to ask if you guys have questions. <laughs> we've, been, we've been off for the summer. Yeah, um, I, I, I was, I was curious because actually, I, I thought it was just a, an interesting point, and like, um, as far as like you moving kind of creating the balance for yourself like with the you know separating the workspace from the home space and mm -hmm. just finding the other things um you know has that just kind of been a natural progression of things you just realized you were like working all the time <laughs> or had the potential yeah to? yeah pretty much i think you know it was there were times where it was very overwhelming to have so many projects on the go um combining that with things that are outside of work and it makes it super stressful. So I think having the separation, it's it's nice in one perspective because you're like, you know, any mess that I've left at home or, or the dishes that I haven't done are, are at home and they don't bother me while I'm working, right? So even if I'm coming here to work on my own, you know, it's kind of like a clean slate. I can just focus on work. So I would definitely recommend people try it out. You can even just take your laptop and go to a coffee shop or sit in a hotel lobby or something and see if that impacts your productivity. Um, and I think a lot of people realize instead of everybody loving working at home, I think a lot of us are kind of past that and realize that we still need that human connection. As great as these video calls are, it's still great to go somewhere and it forces you to get outside and get some exercise too. Yeah, definitely. Maggie, do you have any Questions? Oh, you're muted. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mute myself. Uh, yeah, that's why those conferences are great too. It's so nice to meet coworkers exactly. in real life, and um, yeah, because we've all seen each other so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's been great to see the two of you at the uh, awards conference, and um, maybe if I can make it to Chicago, I'll see I'll see Jeremy there. There we go. Yeah, that would be terrific. All right, so I'm not going to repeat all that stuff I jumped ahead on before, <laughs> but but if you are in the Toronto area, we'd love to see you at our our Toronto Watch party. We just have to find the location first. So, yep. <laughs> Maggie, do you want to read us out here? Yeah. So thanks for watching the show. Visit um, our website at nocornorth.com and sign up for our mailing list to receive all of our latest updates. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or X, I guess. Twin, uh, like. <laughs> Oh my God, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Join us on Fridays in the Lodge, our cool gather space. Our Lodge Hangouts are open to everyone. Until next time, see ya. Bye, and thank Bye. you so much, Eric, Bye, for joining us. Thank you. It's wonderful.